Part 3, Chapter 4, Benign My emergence from the forest felt sticky and coarse. The excreted toxins from our transformation and fighting efforts would safely dissipate away from people over time, and hopefully not draw any attention from hunters. Alice said it shouldn't. Tiffle don't sense the smog in the same way they sense an anima. After all, we've had bouts like this more than a dozen times, and there haven't been any issues. Under the spotlight sun, I secured my beanie and gazed over the backyard. So vast and empty, beautifully dotted by dandelions and dark patches of crabgrass. I watched as a handful of birds perched on telephone lines across the street, whereas butterflies competed with dragonflies for lower airspace. The ringing in my head and throb in my ligaments cemented me here a moment longer, slowly resetting. Within five minutes of idling, I heard the rolling of tires approach from the road. The width of each rubber wheel, the soft mechanical grind of the undercarriage, and the dulcet instrumental music concealed behind thick glass introduced the vehicle as the one I'd been waiting for. I started making my way across the lawn. Halfway to the corner of the house, the car settled in its space and shivered until quiet. Two doors popped open and a conversation was severed. I reached the corner to exchange glances with Tansu as she hoisted her backpack over the shoulder and shut the passenger side door. I waved. Hey, Tan. Hello, Miss Kari. Kari stood on the walkway, daffodils and hydrangeas blooming along the brick steps and obscuring her ankles. She replied, surprised to see me. Oh, Kim, what were you doing in the yard? I gestured behind me with my thumb. I went on a quick woods walk. Guess I decided to head back at the perfect time. Tonsu rounded the car. Did you decide to leave school just so you could go exploring the woods again? She insinuated with a devious grin. Nah, my dad used to let me skip half days, and I just got super bored halfway through. I kind of missed walking home, so I figured today would be perfect. When I got home, I still had some energy left, so I went into the woods. Tonsu folded her arms, smirking. Well, I'm glad you made it home all right. Kari asked. Ooh, maybe we should all go for a hike sometime. It could be fun. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. You can take us along your favorite path, Kimmy. <laughs> sure. Alice glowered, a reminder. I'm not stupid. Obviously, I couldn't take them anywhere near my pathways. Anyway, how was the appointment? She continued to the front door. They changed my medication again. Supposedly, the side effects should be more predictable, Kari said. Tansu caught up to her, and I tailed behind them. They both entered, and I bent to grab my backpack from the doorway. I stepped inside, close behind them, and went to drop my bag by the entrance, as per old habits, but Tansu caught me and gestured her hand. I smirked and looped the strap over her hand, and she raised her brows as she maneuvered over the carpet. I looked at Kari again. <laughs> anyway, how was the appointment? Kari stopped just off to the side, between the living room and the kitchen. They changed my medication again. Supposedly, the side effects should be more predictable. I grinned. Fewer side effects would be preferable. Kari set her purse on the kitchen island. Yes, well, random nausea is a new one. They can't seem to figure out what causes it. My diet barely changes, and I don't eat junk food. Tansu added, dropping our bags by the bedroom door and centering at the junction. I get nauseous more often, too, so I don't think it's your medication. I looked between them, noticing the pattern. Tansu had brought up her nausea, headaches, and a tendency to get hit with depressive waves. I knew why, but obviously couldn't share that. I had to play along. Maybe it's the elevation difference or air quality? Kari shrugged sounding tired but offering a smile. Perhaps it's simply a placebo. Either way, it isn't the end of the world. She took some receipts out of her purse and dropped them into a corner drawer in the kitchen. She then turned to the both of us, who now meandered over to the island as well. What are we thinking for dinner, girls? I leaned against it, elbows folded, while Tansu clasped her hands behind her back and swiveled. Tansu asked, How much effort do you want to put into dinner? Kari implied, if everyone pitches in, then effort isn't a concern. 
Tonsu and I shared a look, and I said, well, What if we just order pizza? We haven't done that in a while. So, no effort. I smirked. Tonsu nodded. Pizza sounds great. I added, We could do less sauce with tomato and spinach, or basil. Thin crust so it's not so heavy. Kari unbuckled the sapphire bracelet and dropped it into her purse. Then she started to undo her earrings as she replied, I suppose we can get pizza. Do you girls have any homework? I shook my head. I don't. I looked at Tonsu, and she shook her head as well. Should we make a night of it, then? I suggested. Tonsu bounced in place a little. Yeah, movie night. Kari chuckled and exhaled. Looks like we have a plan set, she addressed me. If you want, you can invite your friend Joey. He can help pick out a movie. I nodded. Sure. I then lifted myself off the counter and stepped backward toward the phone. If you have cash, we can have him just pick it up so you don't have to go back out. Tonsu interjected. Actually, maybe I can drive. Or you can, Kimmy. I raised my hands defensively, reaching the phone and half turning toward it. Huh, pass. You can go ahead, though. You can't avoid the wheel forever, she sang. I laughed. Watch me. I took the phone off the hook and held it a moment. Suddenly, distant, the dial tone rang hollow in my skull, snagging my thoughts and throwing me back into that terrible night. I felt that exact feeling, the disgust and fear as I called the police on my own murder scene. I couldn't blink, stricken by this without any cause or warning. Shadows overtook my sight, erasing and transitioning what I saw to a memento of the past. I was in the hall at my house, the opaque pressure of my father's still bleeding corpse only feet behind me, beckoning, whispering. I could hear his cries of anguish, I could taste his blood on my tongue. An explosive gunshot rang in my head, and a sting in my shoulder caused me to flinch and drop the phone. As it clattered to the floor, the room went quiet and both Tonsu and her mom looked at me, concerned and confused. The ripple of someone's voice reached me and dragged me from that abyss, though my body was stricken in place. A touch on my shoulder launched me from the catacombs to reality and I turned to face her, pale. Tonsu's brows were raised and her eyes wet and bold. Her mouth moved but the words didn't enter my brain for a full three seconds. What's wrong? I... An airy breath dragged behind my voice. My lips smacked and I cleared my throat, becoming lucid again. I, uh, got a sharp pain in my arm. Sorry about that. I lied. Sharp pain? Did something happen? Kari observed from the island counter. I looked at her and then back to Tonsu. No, no, nothing happened. Um... I was swinging a stick in the woods and threw some rocks. That's all. I must have pulled a muscle. I laughed it off. To show I was okay, I bent down and retrieved the phone, jostling it in my hand and giving her a strained smile. She backed up a step and raised her chin, skeptical. If you say so. I'm good, I promise. She returned to her mom while I dialed his number. I could feel Alice leaning close to my core listening to my heartbeat. The phone rang, and I patiently tapped my finger against my elbow, coddling myself. A soft click. Hello? Hi, is Joey there? The man gave a gruff throat clearing. Yeah, who is this? It's Kim Avery. Is that you, Howard? I said playfully. His tone switched to match mine. How many times do I have to tell you, shortcake? It's Mr. Nelson. Shortcake? I haven't heard that one in years. He laughed a hearty laugh. I could practically hear his bristle blonde mustache scrape the mouthpiece. I just remembered it the other night when Joe and I were talking. Oh? What about? I rotated and leaned against the divider wall. Just you two when you were kids. Then I could hear his hand cover the speaker. Joe, phone for you. He uncovered it and lowered his voice. I've got pot roast coming out, so I'll set you down. He'll be along. Thanks, Mr. Nelson. Take care, kiddo. The phone clattered on some surface, and I was left in silence. I glanced over, and Kari was on her cell phone, assumingly calling in the pizza. 
Tansu started sifting through some mail left on the dining room table. Yo, Joe answered. Hey, what are you up to? Sup, Kim. Nothing much, just me and Nate are working on his dirt bike until dinner's ready. Are you in the mood for pot roast or pizza? I heard him clench his teeth. Mmm, that's a tough one, but I'm gonna have to say pot roast. Sorry. Ah, dang. We decided to have a movie night with pizza. Figured you'd be interested. I would, but tonight's a family night. Everyone's home at the same time for once. He laughed. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, I don't want to screw up family time. I chuckled alongside him. Thanks for the offer, though. Uh, rain check? Rain check, I repeated. I don't want to keep you from the dirt bike, then. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Cool. Later, Kim. Later. I hooked the phone and returned to the counter. Kari looped the purse strap over her shoulder and Tonsu moved away from the dining room when she saw me approach. Joey's busy tonight. Tonsu frowned. Aw, that's okay. More pizza for us. Ha, you mean more for me? You can barely eat two slices. She puffed her cheeks. I am not going to make a comment about how much pizza you eat, because that would be mean. I smirked and raised a brow. You calling me fat? She got red. No, I would never. Actually, I don't know how you can eat four slices every time and still be so skinny. I patted my stomach. I just have a killer metabolism. Kari giggled. All right, you two. She handed the keys to Tonsu, and she took them nervously. I need to use the restroom, so please start the car. Okay, Mom. She clutched them against her chest. Kari stepped away and shut the bathroom door behind her. I took a big breath to reset my lungs and then smiled at Tonsu. She smiled back, the two of us sharing this space in harmony. You nervous? I asked. She smacked her lips. To drive? Always. You do just fine. Remember, I placed a hand on her shoulder and wobbled it in a circle. Loosen up, I emphasized. I know, I know. She exhaled stoutly. I think it's your turn to pick a movie, Kimmy. She pointed to the TV. You do that and get the living room set up while we're gone. Okay, I said casually. She turned away and walked to the front door while I sauntered to the living room. I arrived at the large shelves that encompassed the TV and started scanning the VHS tapes and DVDs. I was always impressed by their amassed collection of media. Movies I'd watched as a kid that I totally forgot about. Newer releases mixed in with sequels and prequels to series I'd only ever heard of. The bathroom door opened and I peered over my shoulder as Kari crossed. We exchanged a positive glance and she made her way out the front door. With it shutting behind her, I dropped my shoulders and was submerged into the lonely atmosphere once more. I didn't linger, mentally or physically. I scavenged the shelves, sliding out plastic cases and sleeves of different movies, trying to decide. Given the long day and forced feelings, something funny and innocent sounded appealing. It took me almost ten minutes to decide, leaving me only a little time to tidy up. I selected a heartwarming movie, one I rented all the time from the library and watched basically on a loop. Kiki's Delivery Service. I first noticed they had this in their collection a few months ago and was sent on an emotional journey from the cover alone. I inserted the VHS tape and felt the static emerge from the television. The credits started rolling on the screen and I hit stop, then rewind. The speedy overlapping chirp of tape being real to the beginning held my ears for a few seconds before I pulled away. I collected some of Tonsu's magazines from the coffee table and hid them away inside the end table drawer. Then I stacked and organized drink coasters and remotes and threw away recently changed batteries. Then I gathered and set up pillows and blankets for three. Amidst setting up, I felt a magnetism pull me toward the living room window. Low-pitched tones flooded the room up to my ankles. Tainted fingers tempted me to recall the hiccup with the phone dial. I stared out the blinds from the couch. A fluttering, wispy sensation danced under my skin as I came to terms with my life for the nth time. So crowded, my mind. So vitriolic and poisoned, yet still capable of this. I never would have thought. How quickly my thoughts can scatter. It may be a simple thing to most. Movie nights and pizza with people you care about. But for me, it's everything.
It's precious, and worth every ounce of suffering I endured to get here. At last, I can finally admit that I'm happy.